my team earlier uh, this week that I don't know about you guys, but I'm on like a digital overload, right? Because we all work from home now. We're, it, we're constantly staring at screens. If we're trying to get better at our craft, what's the best way? YouTube, you know, different things like that. So um, totally a respectable group of, of people trying to get through this. So if, if that's you, uh, thanks so much for coming, regardless of how you're feeling tonight. We just really want to appreciate that. But um, we're going to dive in soon. Uh, real quick, just for your viewing pleasure, I took you on a vacation to my backyard. I'm showing you guys different areas, but uh, uh, we're going to jump in right away, and Rachel's going to kind of take over, and we're going to talk about identifying flaws and what the root causes are, and the reality is root causes are usually coming down to mobility issues and or, Rachel, correct me if I'm wrong, but utilizing kind of a form fit or cookie cutter swing that might not play to those mobility issues. And, and her and I were even just talking about my mobility as an athlete. I'm going to be um, your demonstration tonight, but my mobility as an athlete. And the reality is there's probably a couple of things that I was doing just because I was trained cookie cutter. And I still train most of my kids cookie cutter until I get better at this, um, that I was missing out on quite a bit of power. And so we really want to identify the way that you guys uh, and, and give you guys some some quick tips on how to look for mobility and how it's affecting your kids swing. So I hope you guys enjoy tonight and feel free to drop questions. Um, I'm going to be away from the computer. So Rachel, if you'll just watch the question uh, monitor as we do all this. Yeah. All so, right. Um, we're going to start with um, just the kind of common flaws that we dealt with uh, last like two, I guess, two sessions ago when we talked about feeding the flaw and how to correct your issues with drills. Today is really going to be about attacking the root cause of, uh, of the issues. So typically, uh, we talked about this before and I'll reiterate, swing flaws come down to three things. They come down to a lack of strength, which is the most common. They come down to a lack of, of mobility or a lack of, you know, just inability to complete the movement for whatever reason. And then the third one would be just straight up mechanical, I've been taught in variety kind of thing. So um, we're gonna kind of talk about where some issues are in, at the root cause. Um, and then you can, you can kind of talk about the things that might be overcoached or just utilized in the wrong way. So the first one that we talked about last time was getting stuck on your backside. Um, and so, like that, those are hitters that kind of hang back and you can see how when they land at their launch position, they're like most of their weights on their backside and it never leaves. So those are hitters that get stuck. They typically pull off, spin off a lot of balls and uh, it's just, it gets really, really difficult for them to barrel anything up without slicing it or without, um, you know, just hooking like, it. Yeah. With, without hooking the bar, without slicing it. So, um, the, the, the way that, like, when I look at that, I look at that's usually a hitter's inability to hinge properly. And so, Liz, if you can get into, a, like, a proper hinge position, so if you can stand sideways, right, and then just kind of put, like, the front rack the bat, like, it, like it's a front squat, front rack the bat. Okay. So if you front rack the bat, right, and you go into a hinge position, it would be your heels staying down, your hips kind of driving back, as your knees bend. So go ahead and go into a hinge position. Okay, so right there you can see how her hips drive back and her knees do come out over her toes a little, but not excessive. A hitter that wouldn't be able to hinge properly would be a hitter that would look like as they're going into it, they're gonna topple over the front, they're, they're gonna put all their weight on the balls of their feet. And then you're gonna have a hitter that falls over the plate a lot. And then, so they feel that. And so what do they do? They hang back on their backside. So you have the ability to hinge, especially as you're moving forward, right? As you, as you take your forward move and you can't hold yourself into that hinge position, you're gonna naturally get stuck on that backside and you're gonna load into your knee a lot more. You're gonna load into your quad a little bit more. And so those are hitters that typically stand, stand on the balls of their feet, which we've been taught. There you go, that's exactly what it looks like. So as a hitter, we've been taught for I don't even know how long to stand on the balls of your feet because that's what athletes do, right? And we, we, I've taught that for years, but the truth is we're more stable on our heels. And so especially when we hit, we don't need to be moving quickly. We're not using quick twitch. We're not moving from A to B quickly. 
we're trying to be stable to allow all the pieces on top to move really, really fast. So heel pressure um, and the inability to hinge. So if you can't hinge, and we talked about drills to do like a single leg deadlift or single leg RDL are really good to teach hinges. Um, but basically those are the, um, the things that might cause that is just your inability to hinge. And some athletes just physically can't and you have to teach them how to do it. Um, so that's, that's where we go there. Um, as far so as real ahead, quick, Rachel. So I just wanted to, um, the reason I took my shoes off, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago is a lot of times females, we don't know how to use our foot, but the other reason is, is how many of you guys know your athletes are sliding their cleats on or sliding their practice shoes on without properly tying them. Right. So, uh, John Wooden, I mean, one of the greatest coaches of all times, he even writes in one of his books. I think it's the book, my personal best. He even writes in one of those books about how he teaches his guys. That's the first thing he teaches his guys to tie their shoes properly so that they can be athletic. You know, we try and do that, right? But our girls aren't doing it. So oftentimes when you're testing mobility, in my opinion, it's probably best is at least as you're a new eye to it and you're still learning to take your shoes off so you can see that they're not cheating it. Because I mean, initially my, as I was doing, you know, the bet or the, the weak hip hinge mobility, I was thinking, gosh, they might not even know that my heel's up off the ground right now because my shoes, I just slipped them on to come here. So it's something to keep in mind as you guys are watching or even as your kids are hitting is that the naked eye doesn't see everything, especially if there's the shoe on and your kids aren't doing it right. So that, I like that. If, uh, hit, having your hitters hit with their shoes off too really helps them feel the pressure too. So For keep sure. your shoes off, Liz, because we're getting okay. to the so I think my socks match today. Correct. Today they do. <laughs> um, and it's Thursday. I mean, like you're you're on the end days of the week and your socks still match. It's pretty impressive. Yep, um, I know. So the next one that we talked about was overstriding or lunging. Okay. So if you have a hitter that overstrides or lunges, okay, typically, typically the number one most common factor of that is a lack of ankle mobility in their rear ankle, okay? So people have asked me this a lot. How do you test for ankle mobility? So we're testing for dorsiflexion, okay? Go to your, put your right ankle in front, Liz. You got it. Okay, so what you would do, keep your shoes off for this test, because again, your heel can come off the ground in the shoe and you can't, you won't be able to see it. So put your knee directly over your heel. And when you, drive your knee forward, your heel stays on the ground. Now you have to do this without twisting because if Liz twists, she can get a couple extra inches. See how she got a couple extra inches? You wanna make sure that the leg bone, the, the, the femur, the top of the leg goes straight ahead. Okay, straight ahead. Now once you get to the end range of motion where your heel is still on the ground, you it and you see if your hand can fit in between the bat or the stick or whatever you're using to mark it and your toes. That's usually about, the width of your hand is usually about four inches. We're looking for your, your toe or your knee to get about four inches past your toe. Now, if you don't have proper ankle dorsiflexion, when you're going through your load, you're going to rush out of it. So when you're loading, if you can't sit in that back hip for a decent amount of time, you're going to naturally rush out of it because your ankle doesn't give you the mobility to do it. Okay. So assess your players. If you have lack of ankle mobility, ankle mobility can be improved. All you have to do is do a quick YouTube search, ankle dorsiflexion mobility drills, and you'll come up with a billion of them and they're all good by the way. So you have to be able to have that position. Um, typically you're going to find um, that you, you'll, you'll find hitters with bad ankle mobility and you're like, wow, no wonder that this, this person's timing is terrible or no, no wonder this person struggles with their timing and they lunge a lot because they physically can't hold that position. Another hey, reason. Rachel, hitters, true, yeah, true or false, true or false. Somebody with bad ankle mobility, it doesn't sound like they'd be able to adapt very much within swing. So they'd be really susceptible to the change up, correct? Yeah, of course, because they can't keep okay. their heel on the ground. Your heel is your anchor. So the longer you can keep your back heel on the ground, that's your anchor. That's how, that's literally like how you keep yourself grounded. If you can't, keep your heel in the ground and you're on the ball of your foot, you're immediately unstable like we talked about before and you're gonna start your swing. 
because like we talked about before, and, and instability in your front ankle matters too, right? We, we, we always test them both. You always test both sides. But instability on your front ankle, if you don't have the ability to, to have that, that dorsiflexion held, you can't adjust to your change up with your, with your stride either. So if you can't, you know, when your foot comes down, if you can't physically kind of like sink into the ground to buy yourself some time, then you're going to naturally, as soon as your foot hits the ground, you're going to come up and you're going to start your swing. So it affects your adjustability on both way, on both sides, not only during the load, but also once your foot lands to buy yourself some time into that turn. So ankle mobility is a big one. Um, another reason for lunging is, uh, and I didn't tell you about this one, Liz, but you're going to have fun on camera with this one. You can put your Perfect. shoes back on. So oh, okay. uh, put your shoes back on. Just trust me on this one because you, you'll hit with your shoes and th this will be a good way to, to balance yourself. So um, a lot of reasons why hitters will rush themselves out of their load is because they have poor balance and poor proprioception. So proprioception is basically your, your body's awareness of its environment, okay? And we all know hitters who just like fall more than everybody else, right? Like they're just unathletic or they, well, they appear unathletic or they fall more or they like, they just have terrible balance and you're just like, why? They might just throw proprioception, which can be improved. Um, and so you have to do it with a lot of you have to literally do it with a lot of balance work and a lot of single leg stuff. But um, one of the ways to test for this one is a single leg balance test. So what you're going to do, put the bat down. Are you going to make me close this, my eyes? This is my dummy. I am going to make you close your eyes. <laughs> so you're going to lift one. I don't care which leg you're on. Okay. You're going to lift one leg up. Anybody who laughs has to do this on their own too. Okay. Correct. Okay. Knee, foot's got to be straight out. You're straight up Captain Morgan posing, posing right now, okay? Excuse me, Almost, like this? Much, straight ahead, straight ahead, okay. okay? Now, arms at your side. Okay, when you feel comfortable, you're going to close your eyes. Don't close them yet. Oh, I just if did. If your sorry. arms airplane at all to keep yourself up, the test is over, okay? Okay. Your goal is to try to get to 15 seconds. I'm going to let you, you count. I've been closed already! <laughs> Okay. okay. All right. Let me do it again. Sorry, everyone. I didn't mean to shout in your ears, but it was real intense for me. All right. Let's go this side. All right. Ready? I'm going to close. Good. For real? <laughs> okay. So once everybody can stand on one leg, okay, right? But once your eyes close, you lose where the ground is. And so now what does your body do? Your body craves balance. It will always crave balance. So what happens is your body's like, your brain says, hey, dummy, put your foot down, right? And we have to fight that. Well, guess what's happening while a pitch is coming in with less than a quarter of a second of reaction time? We're not hey, looking, dummy, we, we can't down. feel the ground anymore. We're looking at the ball, right? So if we don't have good balance and good proprioception and awareness of our environment, you probably shouldn't spend a significant amount of time on one leg, right? So if you think about like major league hitters like Javier Baez or um, I'm trying to think of other big leg kick hitters, Javier Baez is the first one that comes to mind. If he had poor balance and poor proprioception, like he would never get on time. His foot would, he'd lift that leg and it'd come right back down because he'd have no choice. But if you notice, he can sit in that back leg forever, right? And so that, that's something that he can do. That might not be a thing that your hitter does, and so you want to put the foot on the ground. Now, at the same time, our, our natural inclination is like, well, when, why do you need the leg kick at all? Well, Javi Baez, he appears like not, I know that I coach in the Cubs organization. I've never worked with the guy, okay, ever. So I have watched it. Like, it, it, he needs that move. It, it, it needs to happen in a swing to take slack out. Um, to get him to separate well, because he's a pretty loose moving guy. If you take the leg kick out of a hitter like that, you might make him worse, right? He might need that move. And I'm not speaking for him. I don't know what he needs. I've, I've never worked with the guy. I've just seen him hit, okay? But that might be what he needs, and you might be making a hitter just to make it simple, right? When, but you also might be taking a hitter that has terrible balance, hits with the leg kick. It looks great. They hit great in practice when all the environment is under control, and all of a sudden, when a ball starts flying out, they have no adjustability, right? And so if you think about it, your lack of, of stability on both legs matters, right? We have to hold the back leg during the load of the swing.
But then once the front leg lands, we have to be able to like use that leg effectively too. Right? You can see, and when you do that test, look at where the instability is coming from, right? If you see the lower leg or the ankle is, is trying really hard to stabilize, that's what you want to see, right? When you start seeing the hips and the arms try to do it, now you're looking at a hitter that doesn't have good control over their body, right? Because typically what you're testing for in that test is lower leg stability. But if you see that ankle wiggling all over the place and it's really struggling, then you might have an ankle mobility issue as well. So those are, that's something that you can, um, you can look at. Um, so Rachel, as I'm, as I'm trying to anticipate, you know, utilizing this and, and one of our goals guys is that you guys use this as practically and as quickly as you can, because we'd love to then turn around and have feedback as to what you're experiencing. This isn't like a, let's preach to you guys for the next six months, and then you eventually think about it in four years from now. We're hopeful that you're, you're able to find ways, even if it's on yourself, to test this out. But Rachel, as I'm kind of thinking, you know, this is bridging baseball and fast pitch, right? Um, I'm kind of thinking more in baseball than in softball, but some of those, you know, diehard softball players, they watch a lot of baseball guys hit, and usually their favorite player is the one they try and emulate, which I think is incredible. I yep. think that that needs to happen more often. But would you say that that is a great way, doing that test might be a great way to take a young kid who's thinking that they want to be a leg kick person and teach them as to why maybe that's not the best move for them? Yes. I, I, would, I would take a player like that, and I've done it before, um, is I give them two choices. Number one, you work every single day to improve your single leg balance if that's what you really want to do. Or – you, you, you simplify your move. You, you get, you have two choices, right? And, and then some hitters are just like, ah, screw it. I just want to put down and, and go then out of pool style or Rachel Holden's style with just a tiny little toe tap or, you know, a simple move. And then you have hitters that are like, nah, I want to hit like Javi Baez. And I'm like, dude, that's cool. Like if, if it was up to me, I wish I was a loose mover and I could hit like that dude because his swing looks awesome. And he's got a lot of swag in his swing but it ain't gonna work for me, right? So, and that's, that's kind of like we, the trial and error of coaches is like, pick, let them pick the move, give them the freedom to pick the move and then kind of try to diagnose why it, whether it will work or whether it won't work, right? But don't just sit there and say, oh, immediately leg kicks won't work or immediately leg kick, you know, you have to have a big stride to have power and momentum is power. They're, they're not the same, like they're not the same and you have to understand what works for each hitter. And that's kind of what we're after in these talks. Like, it, it's this is this is where hitting is, has gone. It's like we all understand. Or we don't all understand, but we're starting to understand more. Is one way to hit doesn't work for everybody, right? Like we all we all look at the swings that we like. We look at the visually stimulating swings, and we say, "Hey, this is what what we like, and this is what should work." But it might not be what works for you, and and that's what we're kind of getting at here. Sure. So ankle mobility, we talked about, um, what, what do you think we should address next? We've, we've addressed the flaw of sitting on the backside too long, the flaw of, um, lunging on the front side, um, too early. What's next? So, there you go. All right. She got muted. So, um, the, uh, I, I have next is that like the arm bar and the casting of the front arm. Okay, that, perfect. And that length in the swing. Okay, so show me, Liz. Because this is what I always did. <laughs> okay, now start your turn with that straight front arm so we can all see what happens. You see the length, the barrel gets away from the body, and now we're getting that early rollover, right? We're getting that early rollover, that straight front arm, or we're getting jammed like crazy and hitting the ball off of the skinny part of the bat instead of the fat part of the bat, right? We all do that. We've all been there, okay? Number one issue with this one and the root cause of this one is strength, okay? It's a strength issue. I'm not shocked. Yeah, I'm not shocked. That's why when you watch a video of every eight-year-old in America swinging the bat or around the world, they all have a straight front arm because they don't have a ton of strength, okay? So it, first, you got to fix this in the weight room. And the, the particular part of your body, this is the most under-trained part of the body, in my opinion, 
is your the, the muscles surrounding your scapula or your shoulder blades, okay? So looking at an anatomy book, I'm not an American anatomy professor. I don't pretend to be. Um, I have a history degree if we want to talk about history at any point, and I'm not even sure I know a lot about that. Um, but if you like look at the muscles that surround a scap, right? And, and we're not just talking like, I think our natural inclination is to talk about our, our elbows pulling back into retraction, right? But you also need to have strength as your, as your arms, as your scaps protract too, and they go away from you because you will need to hold that position in the front of the zone. So let's say we're spooled on a change up and my arms have already begun to extend, right? I want to have that ability to stay on plane for just a split second longer and maybe bloop a hit in or something like that, right? But our scap, so go to your, go to your hitter seat position, go to your launch position, right? So we like to look at, okay, a lot of people pay attention to the height of the elbow, right? It's not necessarily the height of the elbow, right? Above the hand, it, it shouldn't really be above the hands. We call it a high elbow, that's not good. But it should be either even with the hands or slightly below the hands, depending on your mobility again, and that's a shoulder mobility, that's a talk for another time. But drive your elbow towards that new uh, jungle gym you built back there, okay? Okay, don't turn your shoulders, just drive your elbow back. Okay, so that right there, you feel your, your that pinch that's going on, right? Yeah. Now, as you begin to turn your hips, hold that pinch as long as you can as you turn. And what is happening to that back shoulder? It's automatically getting pulled down. Do you feel it? Yep. So that's your lat. Those are those big triangular muscles on your back called or your little, lat. Little that triangle. That lat is what's pulling that shoulder blade down, but it's happening naturally. Okay? So if you do that, and you keep your scap engagement, right? That front arm is gonna say, they're both connected to the same thing, right? So if that- Hey, Rachel, I don't know if this happened to everybody else, but you've been kind of spotty on the last one. Would you just repeat what you just said again? Yeah, so if you hold that pinch, that lat is gonna pull your shoulders down, right? But it's also gonna keep that back close to your body. And since your hands are connected to the same thing, the bat, that barrel is gonna, get on plane without you having to go away, right? So, um, and I see this, uh, Audrey Riho said, arms extending away from the body is a lack of body awareness and the um, lack of awareness on how to hit. It can be, but if you aren't, here's the thing though, like if you aren't physically strong enough to hold that scap in place, it's gonna immediately go into protraction and your arms are gonna get away from your body. like. I can't ask you to do something that you aren't physically able to do, right? If you're not strong enough to, to hold that position, your arms are naturally going to get away from your body because as you turn, and anyone who's been on that UFO ride at the fair knows, as you turn, where does all the force go? It goes to the outside, right? When you get stuck to the wall, okay? When you're on that UFO ride, or if you're on a merry-go-round, right? Then yeah, it actually it's, wants to pull you out. So as you turn- force centripetal force. So as you turn, those arms naturally want to leave you because that's where the energy is going and we have to have enough strength to hold that position. And so you can train it by having hitters stay close to their body and it'll work in practice. But the minute they start swinging fast, those are going to come away from your body because they don't have the strength to go. So in my opinion, if you see a hitter that's getting that front arm extended a bunch, that's, hey, I need you to, to go and I need you to like train to do some pull-ups, maybe some handstand holds, uh, maybe something where you can hold things overhead. As, as baseball and softball players, I was always told, uh-uh, we don't lift overhead. That's terrible for you. It's going to hurt you. Well, that's keeping our scaps stable so that they don't go into that protraction position, right? You want to be able to hold it in retraction for just a little bit longer. Okay, so anything you know, that's pulling – Anything like scat push-ups are really good. Those are something you can do at home. Pull-ups and push-ups. Scat push-ups, for those of you that don't know, is a push-up where your arms stay straight. Yep, Liz will show you. Arms stay straight, you let the scaps retract, and then you push them into protraction. So you're training your scaps to move. And the way your scaps move, they move along your rib cage. They move up and down your rib cage. So if we hold them in place and my rib cage moves this way, my scap's going to move with it. They're attached to your ribcage, how they move. 
So just, just some feedback to share with you guys. That's literally the first time I've ever really focused on SCAP. I, I tried about a year ago and I didn't know what I was talking about, so I kept messing kids up, so I stopped. So um, that's literally the first time I've ever had that explained to me like that. And what was unique about it, Rachel and, and, and team that's on, is as I'm thinking about just that elbow and taking it back, she said, take it back to the jungle gym, but taking it back and that's happening. And as I'm rotating and trying to hold back, literally my hands are naturally getting into the position that I am like pounding into my kid's head that they have to get into on their own. I'm not thinking about getting my hands to that position at all. All I was thinking about is what she said is that elbow stays back. I, I contract that scapula and I let my hips start and try and hold that as long as possible. And I could see where that is incredibly fast. And as I picture, so we talked about centrifugal force guys, that's, that's the circle move that's kind of pushing everything out. Um, I think about, there's a, a, a picture of Crystal Bustos, a hitter I'm, I'm very familiar with, um, hitting this ball like God awfully, like all the way up a light post as far out as, as known to man. And um, what's the coolest thing about that is that when she's striking the ball, her ponytail, for those of you that don't know her, her ponytail was like about down to here, is straight out because she's literally created so much force as she's rotated the hips that everything has gone away. So um, it's kind of an incredible thing uh, to think about how easy that just became. And I'm not strong in my upper body at all. So for those of you guys struggling to get that point across, I mean, I would say some words that really resonated with me was that elbow back to whatever's directly behind them at the time and also just holding it there as long as you possibly can while you rotate. Those two concepts were very easy to grasp onto and really got me into the right position. So just uh, feedback for you guys. One thing I'll tell you, so Liz, if you can face sideways on the camera, we'll both do this one. Um, like this? Yep, you, where you are is fine. And put your elbows up where they're parallel with the ground, like this. You can- if Holding you can, my bat? Nope, put your bat down. Just put both arms see you. They're up, they're 90 degrees, right? Pull them down, and then, so they're parallel to the ground. Forearms parallel, good. Now, without pulling your elbows straight down, pull them straight back. Okay, so start with the, the, even with your shoulders and then pull them straight back. Do it again. Okay, go ahead. So Liz is like kind of tight in that regard, right? So me too, right? So if I go from here and I pull, that's as far as mine go. You'll have kids and I'm gonna have to manually do this and manipulate it, where they'll be able to pull back a lot further. So when you're cheating this move, Make sure you're accounting for that too, because the kids that have a bigger pull, you're going to see a lot more of their elbow as they, as they hold that position, but a tighter mover like us, you're not going to see a ton of that elbow peeking out the back. And so that's, that's something that you want to be careful of. So when you look and you're like, pull that elbow back, pull that elbow back. Well, then their shoulders will start to turn. And that's when, and we'll address this question now because Cameron asked this question. Well, how do you fix wrapping the bat? Well, the bat should be, the knob should be pointed to the catcher at the beginning of the swing, right? Like it should be behind your head at, at, some, at some capacity. But when you start over wrapping, that's just a hitter trying to get strength somehow, some way. Instead of holding that scap into that position, they're trying to create the same thing by overturning their torso. And so those are the hitters that you get that are really, really jammed. So, and it's, again, when you see that overturning of the torso, it's going to be, and we'll kind of address this now with, uh, with the torso test, which Liz did earlier, is you'll kind of be able to diagnose what kind of moves your hitter needs. So if you sit there, do you get your bat? Uh, yep, sorry. That's all right. We'll just I'll move back so you can see my getting feet. Up, getting down. <laughs> getting a workout into this is fun. So if you put your right foot over your left foot and keep your feet flat on the ground, bat behind you. Now turn to your right. So go back to the, go back to the middle. So what you're looking at is you're looking at her sternum. So if you look at where her necklace is, okay, right above the tilt sign, her necklace, that's the spot where we want to see. So right now facing the camera is zero degrees. And then if she, as she turns, if she was facing completely sideways, it would be 90 degrees. And we're kind of just deducing where she is in there. So as she turns, Liz can turn while keeping her feet on the ground like she is. She can turn really far. So she can turn about 65, 70 degrees inward to her right. And then now switch your feet and turn to your left. 
and she could turn even further on the left. You can see that sternum got further. So what I would say is you would classify as a loose mover. Now I'm gonna do the same test and I know you can't tell where, like you can't see my feet, but you don't need to. I'm gonna do the same test, okay? And we're gonna show you how we're two different hitters right now, okay, ready? That's me to the right, okay? I could turn about 40 degrees, okay? And then this is me to the left and it's about 45, okay? So I don't have a high level of mobility and you do. So Liz is most likely gonna naturally wrap a little bit more than me because her rubber band in her torso is longer than mine. She's naturally gonna do it. I'm gonna naturally do it a little bit less. So before you say, oh, you're over wrapping your back, make sure you know what kind of mover you are. Now, Liz, if you had your mobility on your torso and your elbow would go back really far, you're gonna see a lot of, if you were hitting from the pitcher's view, I'd be able to see almost your whole jersey number, but you don't, you're not that mobile. So right now you can't even see the pitcher if you turn that right. much. So she can't do it, can't. she's not that mobile. So get to the spot, yeah, right there is where she's probably, her rubber band is pulled tight and you can see her elbow on that side. If I did the same thing, you might not be able to see my elbow. So because- And that's so interesting, Rachel, right? Because I've always been taught, oh my gosh, and I'm telling kids not to wrap their bat, right? And this to me would be wrapping their bat. So here's the question I have for you is, knowing that I'm in the right position here, is my bat angle off now? No. Do I have to change my hands at all, or am I okay to leave it there? As long as you're comfortable, I think you're fine. Sweet. <laughs> I need to go back and play. I'm old, but. We all need to go back and play. So, <laughs> so like, when you watch that bat wrapping, and I think I, I kind of anticipated someone would ask that question, when you watch a hitter wind up, right, two things. Number one, tell them when they're doing their tee work, don't look at the tee, look at the pitcher. That way, until their foot comes down, that way they don't overturn. Because once you look at the tee, I can turn a bunch and still see the tee. But if I'm looking at the pitcher, I can't, I, I like physically can't turn my head that far and see the pitcher. So you have them look at the pitcher until they are, their foot comes down and then find the ball on the tee. The ball won't move. I always tell them that. The ball's not going anywhere. I promise it'll still be there right where you left it, right? So make sure they're looking at watching the ball in, like they're tracking a ball in. That way you, you combat that overturn and just building that pattern. But number two, instead of trying to get your shoulders behind your hips, try to get your hips in front of your shoulders. Does that make sense? So as you, you we, Liz talked about this before, what position should my front foot land in? Should it land sideways? Should it land open? Well, whatever position it needs to land in to get your front foot open. Right, so Liz, tell me, you, you were talking before, and we'll talk about hip mobility right here too, um, you know, like overstriding, lunging, um, a, hitting with a bent front leg. All of this has to do sometimes with hip mobility too, lack of posture. So show me what you told me earlier about the position you did land in when you were hitting, when you were playing. Uh, I oftentimes landed like this. So upper body strength problems, right? But um, I oftentimes landed with my toe closed. I guess. Closed, okay. So now would that be better than open? And I don't know the answer to that until we screen you. So let's screen, okay? So put the bat down, okay? So put your right toe next to your left heel, okay? Hands on your hips. Now keep that left foot completely flat. Don't let the heel come off the ground. You're supposed to do this with your shoes off, but I'm not gonna make you take your shoes off, okay? So go ahead and turn to your left. Okay, so right there, what you're watching for, go back to the center, is how far the belt buckle turns or where her drawstring is, okay? Right there, how far does that turn away from the camera, okay? So she's got pretty good mobility on her front leg. So that means her body is not gonna be able to stop. Her front leg is not gonna be able to post until she reaches that end of that end range of motion, right? So Liz, I would tell you, you need to land with the, with the closed front foot. And it's like your body figured that out. Or you would need to stride across your body slightly, like a Jose Altuve, with so when you stride. So that way you reach that end range of motion. Now, turn, uh, switch your feet, switch your feet, okay? Well, you could, you could turn the other way too if you wanted to. So that was internal rotation, and now this is external rotation. So she's significantly tighter on that side. 
So she turns about 40 degrees, maybe 45 degrees. So hey, that- Rachel, question, should you, does the knee matter? Because did you notice how I was turning and then my right knee started to go out? Does that matter? That, that whatever happens to that right leg does not matter. Okay. There All you right, go. good. Okay, Thank now you. do the other leg. So there you go. So she, significant, go back again. You're significantly tighter on that side, not significantly, but you turn about 55 degrees there. And then now turn to your right, to your left, I'm sorry. Ooh. Without I'm gonna fault. put my hands back on my hips, sorry guys. Okay, and she's really tight that way. So she's at about like 40 degrees, okay? So what you see is, if you have high external mobility, so do that again, okay? Turn to your left. If that is high, if you're super mobile on that side, you're gonna need a bigger stride, okay? So if you have hitters that naturally walk with their feet out, that's typically someone who's stuck in external rotation, like duck footed kids. They're going to need bigger strides. It's just the, nat the nature of the business. That's usually how it goes. Because your body will not transfer energy to the next segment until the segment below is able to stop. Right? So if we can't stop, if we're still turning because we're loosey goosey, that's where you have hitters that need bigger moves. So I think of immediately, like back in the day, of like a Jeff Bagwell. Right? Remember watching him hit for the Houston Astros? What about Francesca Anaya? Huh? Francesca Anaya had that huge stride, her too. I would love to measure her hips, right? Because they have to hit with that super wide base or else they're not stable and they'll never get to that position of stability. And so if you're trying to make your swing more efficient, you have to address those kinds of things. So I know we kind of got off topic. We're not really talking about flaws, we're talking about swing building and swing styles now, but all those things matter right and you have to be able to assess those so um and this kind of goes hand in hand with uh like a, a, a posture in your swing so like being able to hold your posture as you swing a lot of that has to do with your hip mobility right so if you have really tight hips like i do okay and you stride like with a closed front foot okay i have tight hips you stride with a with a closed front foot as soon as I turn, I'm gonna reach my end range of motion and I can't stay there any longer. So what am I naturally gonna do? A, that front foot's gonna give, but I'm gonna pull off with my upper body because your, your body is not gonna injure itself. It's not gonna happen, okay? So tight hips here, you, you hit your range and then you've gotta open your chest. Because you're gonna stand up because standing up is way more stable than staying leaned over, right? Right, so I can't stay there, so you're gonna stand up. So what are you gonna do? You're gonna pull off the ball. Right. Okay? So typically when you have a tighter hip hitter, they're gonna land with their foot more open or they might even stride open. They might step in the bucket, people, and that's okay. Not that much, but it's okay, right? Yeah, just careful. So when you get there, and especially if you have, and this is a very common movement profile, okay? This is like the most common. Most kids ages like 11 and under have tight hips, and loose thoracic upper, their, their loose upper body. And here's why, because they sit in a chair all day at school and what happens? Oh, I need something out of my backpack. I go get it. Oh, let me turn around and talk to my buddy behind me, right? Let me, let me reach down and tie my shoe. They never get up, so they never move their hips, but they're really good at moving up here. So they have a really loose upper body, really tight hips. When you have those hitters, what do, what do most kids do? And every parent has yelled at their kid for this. Don't step out. You're stepping in the bucket, don't step out. Well, they're trying to reach their end range of motion faster. It's like their body is picking the right move and we're coaching it out, right? Now, I'm not saying all of your hitters need to step open and, and do all that. You need to train this in different ways. And that's another topic on another time. But if your kid is stepping in the bucket, is it really like a, like a mechanical issue or is it just a mobility issue that we just need to either improve their hip mobility a little bit or just maybe change the position that they land in? right? Because our foot is, you ever see the hitters that land and their foot naturally opens or they roll out on the outside of their foot? The closer you are to stable at landing, the quicker you're going to be. And so with a hitter that is looser, you're going to stride close because that's the quickest way to get to stable, right? And then with a hitter that's tight, you might need to open that foot almost to the pitcher, right? And then that's where you're going to reach your level of stability too. So experiment with both and you'll find out, you'll find out which one is quicker. You'll find out really quickly actually, but experiment, Interesting. It's, not, it's not blanket for everybody. 
No, because I actually have a I have a hitter um, that's been on the call quite a bit. Um, and I'm as I'm just thinking about her swing. First off, she's pretty big. She's got pretty big motion on the backside. Um, she's still very weaker upper body, so she she does a lot of what we talked about long arms sometimes. Um, and then she strides, and oftentimes when she strides, she will almost stride closed toed. But her first movement as she goes to torque, and it's just very fast hits with a lot of power but you'll see her go like this and release like that hitter that like cannot cannot ground down because she's just her hips are incredibly tight so that's that's great and she's a pitcher so does that usually correlate yeah i think you could do this with pitchers too some pitchers like monica abbott land with their foot completely facing the catcher right and then you have pitchers like daniel laurie that landed with their feet completely sideways right, right. But it, it's again, it, it just depends on the pitcher. It depends on the mover, right? So you're going to find as coaches, like as you go down these, these coaching rabbit holes, when hitters ask you questions like, hey, how do I stop from, from doing this? Or how do I fix this? And then you're going to start answering a lot more questions with like, uh, I don't really know. It, it depends. Like it depends is like, it comes out of my mouth more than anything else because like it really does depend on like a ton of different factors right how strong are you how, how well do you move and i can't stress this enough i should have said this at the beginning loose is not better than tight it's not it's just different okay i'm gonna be on i'm doing a blast motion webinar tomorrow and this is literally my entire topic of the talk is to coaching loose movers and coaching tight movers and that it's not better they're just different okay liz and i were both professional softball players with two very different movement profiles, as you just saw. And we were both really, really successful. And not, our swings didn't look alike either, right? So not like- Not even close. Yeah, so th there's, there's different ways to coach things and there's different ways to coach them. And in our, in our case, honestly, our coaches didn't know this stuff. We just got lucky. We, we were really good athletes and no one tried to coach it out of us. So we just kept playing and kept getting better. Your, your body is really good at being efficient. We, we try to like, coach that out of our kids sometimes and we have to just let them be efficient oh that's uh, me a hundred percent i'm coaching the everything good out of my kids right now all right um we've got a question from rick here it says do you recommend something like on base you screening or is there something else you can recommend uh yeah on base you is good they're very very good um at their uh if they're expensive it's a thousand dollars to go to the um the conference but you can say you're on base, you screened. And um, I'm very familiar with the test and they do a really good job. They do a really good job of explaining things. They talk about what they call the 13 uh, biggest inhibitors of a swing and the kind of like what we're doing now, the flaws in a swing and um, what's causing them. Is it like a mobility or strength issue? Um, they do a really, really good job. Um, if you can afford it, I do recommend it. I do. Um, if you can't, if you can literally do the hip mobility test um, and the torso mobility test, you can do a lot with that. And we just told you what those are. You can do a lot with that. Just on, just on building swing patterns. Always assume if you want some low hanging fruit, always assume your hitters can be stronger in their upper back, can be stronger in their glutes, and can be stronger in their core. Just always assume those three things. If you can have them, their core can be super stable, they're super strong in their upper back, and their glutes are really strong. If, if your hitter does those three things and they're anything but like a terrible crappy mover, they'll, they'll swing a bat really fast. So, so Rachel, here's a question. I know you, although you're a lefty, you weren't exactly a slapper. Um, so the question I have for you is, is typically, especially when kids are younger um, or even sometimes kids come in their freshman year of college and we see, blazing, blazing speed, maybe quite a few flaws from the right side. We don't ever think they're going to hit with too, you know, too much power from the right side. And we check dominant eyes and things, and we just see the tools to turn them into a lefty slapper. Do you think it's probably in our best interest to, A, test their balance? Uh, I, forgive me, I can't recall the term, but the one where you made me look awesome um, and athletic on, uh, test the balance first. And B, you know, even if we decide to still proceed forward with that, do you think that we should be adding into maybe our lefty slappers uh, daily repertoire to do stuff where they're working on improving that? Because I mean, the reality is, is 
that's more than anything incredibly athletic to be moving at the ball now what you're saying is not looking at the ground landing and anchoring properly and still being successful yeah i think when you watch a slapper like if you if you ever watch a video of a slapper and you like zoom it in and cut the legs off the upper body should behave very similarly to a hitter so right. to me, the primary thing you should be looking for with a slapper is making sure they are loose enough to be a slapper like you've got to have good hip mobility and you got to have good torso mobility like you have to if you're if you're a tight mover in any way, slapping is going to be really hard for you, right? And 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 so even you might be fast. Tight movers run really fast sometimes. They they do. They run really fast sometimes. There are some absolute burners on your team that probably can't touch their toes, right? Yes. Like they, you can move really fast when your muscles are super taut. Okay. Sure. So you, you can do that. So first, I would I would assess their mobility first with those two, the hip test and the torso test, but. Um, yeah, I think anything that you can do to improve anyone's proprioception should be fantastic. Do a lot of single leg drills. Um, you know, it, it, like one of the hitting drills that I've had a lot of my girls do is, um, and I know Frank's on here and I've had his daughter do this because she has terrible balance. Jordan, Jordan and I have the worst balance of anyone I've ever seen. And she knows it. Like we've talked about this. She knows it. And Jordan has to do a lot of work on one leg. Like she just does. So she, Jordan always, when she comes and does her warm ups before lessons and stuff, she always grabs the Bosu ball and just tries to stand on it and just see how long she can stand on it. And then she tries to do it with her eyes closed. And she's just working on it, like just trying to improve it. And it's still not great, but it has improved. And so you can see that a lot. So like with Jordan, we talked about like she she needs she's a loose mover with poor balance. And so she needs a big move, but we can't really give it to her because she can't stand on one leg for a long time. So what do we do with Jordan? We did a, a few things, but where we're at right now is she actually takes a short, a step back into her load, toe taps halfway and then strides. So she keeps herself on the ground, but she uses the ground for rhythm instead of staying in the air and trying to stay balanced because she just doesn't have that luxury, right? So she kind of increases step back, toe tap, go, step back, toe tap, go. And it really, really has improved her timing quite a bit just because we had to figure out a way to take the slack out of her rubber band because she's so loose, but keep her on the ground, which both of those things are really, really hard. So not to make light of a serious situation, but I feel like I need to go to Hitters Anonymous and say, I'm Liz and I've been messing up hitters for years. Um, <laughs> I'd like to start talking about uh, how I'm going to recover from this. So um, I, I think what's what on Twitter, we're all we all talk about all this stupid crap we've done. <laughs> um, the things people paid me to teach their kids years ago, who knows? <laughs> If, if, and if I'm not trolling myself so hard in five years after other things I'm teaching now, we're going to, someone's going to reference this Zoom call because it's going to be on YouTube and they'll be like, dude, what were you doing? And I'm going to be like, dude, I don't know. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Hey, so now's a great time. Let's just take a minute. We've got about nine minutes left. Let's open it up for questions or maybe, you know, you can even paint a picture of a hitter that you've been seeing that um, you feel you know, it's that one frustrating hitter, like maybe they're a queen of the cage and can just drop bombs all day in the cage, but doesn't translate to um, the field. Maybe they, you know, can't hit the outside pitch to save their life, but God forbid a pitcher makes a mistake on the inside. Let's start, you know, let, let's talk about that. I, I mean, I, I know that there are, uh, you know, anomalies out there in the coaching world where we just we feel like we can't connect. I, I know when I was recruiting collegiately, there were just kids. I thought they were phenomenal athletes. God, I would have loved to have them come perform on my team, but I, I knew I probably didn't have the skill set yet to make them better, right? Because they were out, out of my realm. So um, anybody have any hitters that stand out or anything that's coming up um, that they want to talk about? And you can type a little thing and I'll actually unmute you. It's exciting. Yeah, unmute you. You get to talk if you want to. Um, I'll, I'll throw one out there just while everyone's thinking of their questions. Don't everybody ask it once, but while everyone's thinking about their questions, um, a common one is everybody talks about pulling off of that outside pitch or pulling off of the ball. And Liz and I talked about this privately last week. 
And uh, I, you, she was like, okay, well, pulling off is, you know, I think it's this, is this. And I said, honestly, I said, I think it's a deceleration issue. So if you think about it, right, again, we've talked about my hips have to have to start turning and then they have to stop. Then that sends the energy to my torso, which it starts to turn. And then it has to stop as well to then send the energy to my, um, to my arms, right? To get that extension and stay on the path of the ball. So if I don't decelerate my torso, I'm just gonna continue to turn. Now, how hard would it be if I'm still turning this way, but trying to hit the ball that way, right? If, if my shoulders are turning and they never stop, but I'm supposed to stay on the ball that way, that would never happen, right? At some point, we see the ball is outside, we have to stop in order for me to be able to hit that ball. Now, when you watch hitters in fast motion, it looks like they never stop turning, but there's a moment where their shoulders stall and that's where they're passing that energy into the arms. And so that's where, if you want your hitters to stop pulling off, A, they, they, they need to have a stronger core or B, you can tell them, and I, I kind of use this cue is whenever you feel yourself like you're gonna make contact with the ball, pretend like somebody's punching you in the stomach if someone went to punch you in the stomach, what would you do? You would tense your, your core up to try to make it hard so that that punch would hurt less, right? Or like when you're trying to show off your abs, you're like, here, punch me in the stomach, right? And you tense them up. When you turn, for those who have abs, I don't know. Um, so as you turn, right when you get to where you would want to hit the ball, pretend someone's punching you in the stomach, everything will lock up, and then you can, you can let the bat be released from your body. So when we see extension become an issue, that's typically a hitter who's just never stops turning. There's no decel. That's usually what I see. Um, sure. so and for, the, for those of you that don't know what the K-Vest is, the K-Vest measures a lot of things. It tells you if your hips are going before your hands. It tells you the, if the sequence is right. It also tells you uh, when your first move is happening. Is it happening after heel strike or is it happening before? But one piece of what Rachel's talking about is pretty cool is like you have your contact point and it shows you this graph and it's measuring it, showing you your hips and when were your hips at full speed. And technically your hips, your torso, your arms and your hands are all, should all be at full speed at different times. Correct, Rachel? And so, and a lot of times what we see is hitters that first jump on the K vest and all of those are lumped together. Everybody's full speed. They might be full speed at the front part of their swing and they're already deselling at contact or they don't even get to full speed until after contact because that stop never happens. So it's, it's really kind of cool to watch um, on, on graphs. But we've got Audrey here who's asking about hitters who struggle with the off speed pitch and hit, hitters who struggle hitting to um, their power field? So um, first of all, everybody's power field is different. So this is a it depends kind of answer. Um, you're gonna have a hitter like uh, me, for example. Um, I was a- Oppo power. I had a lot of oppo power, but it was fake. It was, it was fake oppo power. If you just squared me up, I would have pulled the ball a lot better. So what I did, I was a lefty, so I would stand, instead of standing square to the pitcher like this, I closed myself off. And the reason I did that was because pitchers, for whatever freaking reason, I closed myself off. They only threw me outside early in my career. So what did I do? I started to turn myself that way. So where is my shoulder pointing right now, my front shoulder? It's pointing towards right over the shortstop's head. So guess what? Guess where all my power was over the shortstop's head, right? Now, if I would have been loose like Liz and taken a stride to get to that position, right, where I'm now closed off, I, I'm going to have natural opposite field power, right? Natural opposite field power. Where me, if you just squared me up, I would have had power to the middle of the field and probably full side power. Right? But nobody threw me there. So I, I didn't need to cover the inside part of the plate until later in my career. So if you have a hitter that naturally has that bigger torso turn, they're going to need an opposite field approach. Now, if you have a tighter mover like myself, assuming I'm squared up, they're going to naturally open up earlier. Right? So if I have a short rubber band instead of a long rubber band, I'm going to be able to snap that rubber band faster. So I'm going to turn faster. And therefore, where does my swing get? It has to, I'm going to have more pull side power, right? So not everybody hits the ball better to left field. 
and not everybody has to go oppo because it's the right thing to do right mike trout's made a phenomenal career and 400 million dollars pulling every almost everything that he hits right and then you have like a javi baez who i think like 65 70 percent of his home runs last year were to right center field or right field right so you have the difference of of types of hitters so not everybody's hit uh um power is to the opposite field now with that being said you still need to cover all parts of the plate that doesn't mean you have to hit every outside pitch to right field if you're ready or every inside pitch to left field you can pull outside pitches too it's more so are we attacking the ball out in front of the plate or are we letting it get a little bit deeper and that's going to be dependent on how much you turn so for a hitter that struggles with off-speed pitches go back to what we talked about about ankle mobility are they rushing their load right are they picking the wrong move are they leg kicking because they don't have balance, right? Does their balance suck, right? So you kind of go back, deduce that. Once we've determined now they have really good ankle mobility, really good balance. Okay, cool. They might be firing from the top early, right? Their hands might be going before their hips. They might be out of sequence and it kind of starts their swing early and then they pull off the ball. Um, and then like, it could be a number of issues. Timing can be, is a cause of a bunch of things. There's not usually one root cause, but I would always start at how you interact with the ground first. Always start with ankle mobility and always start with the, the single leg balance test. I would start with the, both of those. Um, those are probably like a, um, a good place to start. And, and Rachel, going off of what you're talking about ankle mobility wise, I used to always wonder why we shouted sit when it came to hitting the change up. Sit, that's the first thing that we say. And as a younger hitter and even as a coach, I'm thinking, all right, sit in my back leg. Well, yeah, but I've already taken my stride. So I've already moved forward. Sit is okay. Well, maybe we work on like being able to throw the hands like Rachel mentioned, like if I've already started my swing and then I identify that it's a change up and she said, maybe bloop it in the outfield. And I say, just buy yourself another one, like just foul it off if you can um, buy yourself another pitch. But sit is actually, I think it's, it's kind of uncommon or maybe I've just been out of the higher level game long enough. It's kind of uncommon to see coaches talking to um, kids about actually like riding the legs. Like when you're teaching hitting change-ups, again, I used to set a T out front because I thought, well, odds are you're not gonna see it. So just see how far you can reach and poke something foul. But now we talk about when we're, when we're addressing change-up, we talk about literally riding the legs, getting down into the legs a little bit longer. So striding, boom, riding the legs before you swing. And so that, the terminology sit, especially now that I refer to this position as hitter seat, well, now it's not racket science anymore. It's hitter seat and sit, boom, ride the legs a little bit longer before you drive. So um, that's a way to practice that also. You can practice hitting change-ups off of the tee um, when you're talking about fundamentals. You're just teaching them how to get into their legs. So Stuart's got a question. Stuart from Canada, who's always on our calls, which is awesome. He's, his name is Sienna tonight. He said, I got on here late and maybe missed you talked about this, but what do you do for hip mobility testing and how do you fix a lack of mobility there? Well, um, Stuart, we'll put the call on, uh, on YouTube and you can go back and watch it, but lack of mobility, um, more is not always better. So if you take a loose mover and you make them do yoga because you think looser is better, you might've just made that hitter worse right? Typically think about this. The looser you are, the more stable you have to be, okay? The tighter you are, right? You always have to be stable, meaning you need more strength. If you're a loose mover, you need more strength. Otherwise, you're at a high risk of injury, honestly, just in, in general in life and anything you do that's athletic. But if you're a tight mover, you only want to make them a little bit looser because if we, if we take a tight mover like me and you loosen me up, you might have just ended my career. I might have fizzled out at high school varsity softball and never went and played in college and never became a professional because my swing couldn't get up to speed because I was too loose, right? I never picked the right moves, right? Because I came up in the era, and Liz, I'm sure you did too, where everyone was like, listen, softball reaction time is so much quicker than baseball, less is more, right? We all came up in that era. That's not yeah. true. It's, it's not true. The reaction times are a 100 mile per hour pitch is a lot faster than anything you guys will ever see. Okay, so like, it's not true. But I was, I came up in that era. So if I was a loose mover trying to swing with those mechanics, my career is just 
hopefully I was good on defense because I wasn't going to hit well, right? So you might make a hitter worse. More is not always better. And that is, like, I can't stress that enough. It doesn't, like, you know, you watch players play and we think, like, oh, the looser you are, the better. Well, then why did the steroid era come up with the best offensive numbers we've seen ever? Those guys were tight, muscle-bound, and they hit the crap out of the ball. Why? Because they were super stable and they moved really, really fast. And that's what we're trying to do. Yeah. So, hey, so again, uh, we're, we're wrapping up the call now, and I want to thank you guys always for coming on. But as I was thinking about how can we make this better, how can we make this this call be something that people keep coming back to and, and wanting more of is, is really just the idea of, you know, the challenge here is that, can, that you take away something from this call and you put it to use as quickly as you can and you maybe stumble through it and that's okay, but you just apply it and then see how we can help you make it better in the, in the long run. And so I did want to share with you, I thought I couldn't challenge you to do that unless I had done that myself. So my takeaway last week for my call because I was really one of the main people talking was actually uh, we had a coach Z from Wisconsin talk about you know the idea of identity as softball players and making sure that they understand that softball is just a thing that helps them become the people that they are and it's not who they are at the core and uh, challenging them to be great community members so we challenge our organization here to actually make over 200 kids goodie bags um, for staying at home um, and, and getting through this COVID so that was my takeaway last week. We've got committees full of kids now trying to put all this together and, and learn to be um, contributing members of society. So my challenge to you guys this week is take one or two things. Don't don't overload yourself because learning you know takes time, but take one or maybe two things that you heard tonight and apply them so that not only is this feeding you information, but this is evaluating it and seeing what you guys can because, you know, necessity breeds creativity. So maybe you guys are able to find a new and approved way to get this message across to your kids because now more than ever, have we had to really know our craft and be better verbal coaches than ever? Because now you can't just touch them or show them or make them do it, right? Like now you actually have to, you know, use your words to be creative there. So that's my challenge to you guys. Please uh, take something away. Give it a try and then give us your feedback. Let us know if there's anything that you need from us to help make you better or to add it to our conversation for next week. Good job, Liz. Are we going to do defense next week? Yeah, we're going to do some defense. I tried to talk her into letting me do it this week, but she said that her fans would be mad. I don't know why she calls you guys her fans, but no, I'm just I, I had to, I made you call an audible last week and everyone's like, are we still going to talk about the same thing next week? I'm like, yes, we'll talk about the same thing next week. So I don't want to be a liar. Okay. Well, it was one hour prior and I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, what do I, <laughs> so hopefully you guys got something out of it <laughs> and jack is healthy and so we're all happy about that but hey guys have a great great week it's so great to see you and we hope to see you next week hey bring a friend next week though don't just keep us in your back pocket i know unless you're college guys and you want to win next year i get it but share it with your friends real quick to answer brock's question hold on wait not brock uh hold on wait uh little buster Jeff from Arizona, with my young daughter, I started using balance pads to feel, using them through uh, PVC heavy bat drill right away or let her get comfortable balancing with PVC first. Um, I would always start on the ground. Um, start with stability before you remove the instability. I think a lot of the stuff we see online with people standing on balancing pads and stuff is kind of what we call in our, in this business, we call it eye wash. It looks cool, but it doesn't really accomplish anything. Um, so, you know, just, we call it eye wash. It's just, it just doesn't do anything. So um, I would always start with stability first before you work to an unstable position. So they don't I get I think it. we missed something just before that too. I'm so sorry. I asked them in the chat. Uh, Danielle actually asked, do you oh. have any more information about the right side and left side of the brain in the box? I'm so new on that stuff or articles I could read. Yeah, Danielle, actually I was looking it up and it's kind of funny because, you know, 10 years ago when all this became, um, uh, you know, kind of more popular for me, at least, uh, mental, mental ABC, ABCs of baseball, mental, what is it, Rachel? I'm, I'm tripping over myself. What? Anything? 
uh, the mental game of baseball, then there's uh, baseball ABCs, things like that. There are uh, books out there, Danielle, let me look them up for you and share with you. Um, there is an article that I have from many, many years ago talking about that. But yeah, absolutely. I think the scary thing talking about mental game, yep, the mental game of baseball is a great one as well. Uh, there is Brian Kane out there. He's kind of like the hot fad guy. Um, and I don't think he's a fad because he's um, been around incredibly smart. Um, and, and names are not my strength, so as I'm being called to remember them, but incredibly smart uh, mental game guys that just talk about concepts like so what next pitch. They talk about confidence being a choice, different things of that nature. But as far as right side, left side of the brain, if you were to go and Google it right now, you would probably see a lot more conversation about creativity, how to, how to become an artist and things. You could read through those because the reality is, is there's a lot of testing or a lot of activities you can do with your kids to get them more right brain engaged. Um, and those ways will still translate onto the softball field. Um, but what I was talking with uh, Audra, uh, at one of our viewers and, and actually one of Rachel's coaches at Fulton Fast Pitch about earlier is um, if you don't know what a kid's tendency is because we talked about the five things and breathing always being one of them if you don't know what one of their four things is is one if they're old enough to get the concept of each ask them what kind of speaks to you what do you feel like you do and and the kids that kind of drum their fingers while they write a paper like those are your movers um the kids that are super extra like um they might even be your kids that wear bright shoes like the kids that wear bright shoes and, and pick the bright shoes things, those could be your color people that like right brain stuff. But um, you can identify or at least challenge and, and set up a practice um, that plays to each one of those. So like one week we will do a colors practice and I'll see who has a great week at the plate, right? So, or, or one practice and then one practice we'll put on music without words and we'll see who has a great time at the plate, who has a great practice. And so I'm able to kind of trick and assess which one's probably going to fit with whatever um, and, and do it that way. But yeah, Dan, Danielle, if you, Coach Danielle, excuse me, if you don't mind, I will uh, look for those articles and maybe you could drop your email and I'll get them sent over to you once I locate those. It'll probably take me a couple of days just to get a hold of everything I've used. So sweet. All right. We missed, did we miss anything else? What, would you say Freddie Freeman and Miguel Cabrera tight movers just by watching their swing? I answered him in the chat. Okay, great. Okay. And then you got little Buster and then Danielle and thanks for shout out. <laughs> you got it. Oh, that was private. Sorry. Thank you so much, uh, Rachel and Liz. <laughs> yeah, I suck at this. I have one at the end. The rest are a bunch of thank you. Someone said okay. uh, Chad Longworth and Ken Revisa are very, very good sources. Ken Revisa just passed, yeah. I think, last year. Um, and then Billy Bellmeyer said, what you said about wrapping the bat um, and stepping in the bucket had really helped. I've been telling my eight-year-old to work on both of those, and we'll leave those alone now uh, that I know better. Um, the more I coach, the less I say. Um, you know, we don't always need to, to coach them. They'll, they'll figure it out. They'll figure out a lot more than we give them credit for. Um, just let them go and just teach them how to have fun. Give them targets. Give them things like, hey, if you hit it further than you hit it last week, you, I'll buy you ice cream on the way home or something like that, right? Like just let it, t don't take, right now, the only thing you should be focused on is making them swing hard and making the game fun. If the game's not fun for them, they're not going to want to do it anymore. So just make it fun. All right. Bye, everybody. Thank you guys so much for coming. We appreciate you. Thanks, guys. And we'll see you next week. Liz, I'm hopping off. My dogs have to go to the restroom. <laughs> All right. We'll see. You. I'm going to just read the rest of these comments and make sure we address everything. Works good.